Today, a spruikalot, probably signs for the 6th of September 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's show, we look at the rise of NFTs new reports which highlight the pressures and opportunities arising from border closures and a question of missing population growth as well as increased savings rates and we consider the tricky question of broker turnaround times and more partnering as the finance sector tries to navigate the future with the rise of so-called mutual mergers. Firstly, earlier this year investors, hobbyists and art enthusiasts started frantically buying up non fungible tokens or NFTs in another crypto world craze. NFTs transform digital works of art and other collectibles into one of a kind verifiable assets that are easy to trade on the blockchain. Notable examples include a decade old Nyan Cat GIF which sold for $600,000 and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey's first tweet which yielded $2.9 million. As CNN reported, then the fervour subsided and it looked like what some were calling a speculative bubble had popped. But last month, interest in NFTs surged again, triggering a new frenzy. Monthly sales on OpenSea, the top platform for buying and selling NFTs, reached $3.4 billion in August, easily an all-time high according to data from June Analytics. September is already the second best month ever with $485 million in sales as at last Friday. Celebrity attention has helped feed the hype. US NBA star Steph Curry reportedly just paid $180,000 for an NFT from Bored Ape Yacht Club, one of the highest profile NFT projects. He changed his Twitter avatar to display his prize, the image of a blue monkey in a tan suit. And Danny Adkins, co-founder of Moment Ranks, a platform that provides analytics and tools for NFT collectors, said that people like Curry are helping validate digital brands like Bored Ape, giving them the cachet that celebs usually lend to labels like Gucci or Supreme. Athletes and celebrities want to show them off, Adkins said. That's helping the NFT industry build clout. Auction houses have served a similar function. NFTs really started generating public attention after a JPEG file by the digital artist Beeple sold for $69 million at Christie's in March. And this week, Sotheby's will auction off a load of bored ape NFTs which it expects could fetch as much as $18 million. Most NFTs are purchased using Ethereum. The digital currency launched a robust price recovery last month, rallying 36% and it's now trading just below 4,000 US, not far from the record high it hit before cryptocurrencies crashed in May. So the question is, where does this all end? Well, Les Borsai, co-founder of Wave Financial, a Los Angeles-based digital asset investment management firm, dismisses the idea that it's a bubble, given the technology that underlies NFTs. He points to all the ways digital art and collectibles can be monetized, including through the fast-growing world of blockchain-based gaming. A tulip was a tulip, Borsay said, alluding to Dutch tulip mania in the early 17th century, which was one of the most famous market bubbles in history. These things do have completely robust technologies connected to them. Well, sorry, but to me, it looks like yet another bubble as spare cash seeks a new home. Elsewhere, Jonathan Webster, director of Australian-based alternative asset management firm Jameson Capital, says many things about how we will recover from the COVID-19 pandemic remain uncertain, but we already know the impact upon population trends and therefore on real estate development and investment. They will be profound. 
He says he's been immersed in developing a range of real estate investment launches since their establishment back in 2015, closely following trends and demographic shifts to find the best investment opportunities for their clients. As Australia has been drawn into the successive wave of COVID-19, with associated border closures and lockdowns, key population trends are emerging that will impact real estate investment. The Demographic Delays report compiled in April 2021 by Informed Decisions revises Australia's population in 2041 down to around 33.3 million. That's 1.9 million fewer than had been forecast before COVID-19 reached Australia. The missing population, according to estimates supplied by the analysts, based on the Australian Bureau of Statistics, will include 519,000 fewer school children, of which 318,000 are in primary and 201,000 are in secondary. And they, of course, would eventually require homes of their own. Pre-2020, tertiary students have been another important migratory cohort, arriving here to study and staying to work and start families. That stimulus in the residential rental and ownership sectors will also be sorely missed in coming years. Fewer children and young adults arriving as migrants equates to an expected drop in the birth rate, a double whammy when it comes to sustaining population growth and supporting real estate development and construction. For example, there's a prediction that in 2041 for Greater Melbourne, roughly 162,000 less dwellings will be needed than were previously estimated. That's a serious hit when you play out that trend across urban areas around the country, largely down to the impact of prolonged international border closures. In fact, we're already seeing the impact of borders being slammed shut in March and April 2020 as the pandemic arrived via the absence of international arrivals of travellers and migrants. By September 2020, Australia had recorded the first quarterly population decline on record. That's expected to continue for as long as overseas migration remains on hold. And previously, we'd had a regular annual influx of around 218,000 migrants on average. And by 2021, Australia will experience a net migration loss of around 71,600 people. In other words, more Australians will move overseas than migrants will move here. That net loss is expected to continue in 21-22, down another 21,600 before stabilising and moving back to positive territory, albeit at well below pre-COVID levels. So the question is, how will this affect real estate? For a start, COVID has completely overturned decades worth of reliable population trends that enabled demographers and ultimately developers to accurately estimate the type and location of housing stock needed to fulfil demand. The completion of many developments or projects that were planned or had begun before borders closed is creating an oversupply of dwellings that should have been housing an influx over the next 12 to 18 months of around 300,000 migrants but due to border closures, they aren't coming anytime soon. In the short term then, the challenges implicit in the scenario will be felt more keenly in inner urban areas where high-rise developments already started must be finished, whether there's a market for them or not. On the urban fringe, where greenfield housing estates spread, it's at least easier for developers to press pause on the next stage and wait for demand to catch up. In middle urban areas, it's more difficult to make blanket predictions due to different demographic considerations such as ethnicity, density and population age. But the forecasts are for a general decline in development and regeneration activity. Regional areas also like to suffer to varying degrees, some more than others, having set their sights on a migrant-led economic boom. It adds up to greater volatility in the residential real estate sector, with a new set of rules still to be written as Australia attempts to vaccinate its way to a COVID normal future that will include the resumption of international travel with vaccination passports and the restatement of migration that is so crucial to powering the economy. If the Australian federal and state governments are successful in avoiding uncontrolled rates of infection until vaccination levels reach an acceptable level, Australia will be perceived as a safe and attractive migration destination and demand from these purchases will return once again. And while the next few years may look a little less predictable, in the longer term, there is still opportunity for real estate and construction-led recoveries in the post-COVID-19 timeframe. 
And he said that's something that we can perhaps look forward to. Now elsewhere, Momentum Intelligence's Consumer Access to Mortgages report for 2021 has just been published and it's based on a survey of 1,036 consumers between January and April 2021. Now in its third year, the report explores the experiences of consumers across Australia, including those who have never secured a mortgage, to better inform industry stakeholders on the behaviour, expectations and experiences that drive the decisions that consumers make when accessing finance. This year's report aims to help deepen the industry's understanding of how consumers perceive mortgage brokers and proprietary channel lenders across a range of factors. This year's survey found that the mortgage broking channel continues to be the preferred channel among existing borrowers, with 60% intending to use a mortgage broker the next time they take out a mortgage. This level of preference is in line with the flow of new mortgages being written via mortgage brokers and reflects the strength of the mortgage broking industry. As with previous year's reports, broker clients are also much more likely to use a broker again for future lending needs. 83% of broker clients would return to the channel, with less than two-thirds at 61% of direct clients saying they will go direct again. Similarly, the majority of prospective borrowers, future first home buyers, were also found to be more likely to engage with a mortgage broker rather than working directly with a single lender, 56% versus 39%. This preference highlights that the broker proposition has continued to resonate even with those who are yet to make their first move into the property market. It also echoes recent research conducted by Active Pipe, why borrowers choose banks versus brokers, which found that 80% of broker clients would use a broker again for the next transaction. While choice of channel continues to be strong, this year's Consumer Access to Mortgage Report did note that satisfaction is falling. Momentum Intelligence found that 72% of consumers who'd engaged a mortgage broker in the previous 12 months said they were satisfied, while a slightly lower figure at 68% of proprietary channel customers were happy with their experience. While the proprietary channel satisfaction was consistent with the 2020 survey, the gap in broker satisfaction has reduced significantly when compared with previous years, with broker channel satisfaction dropping by 16 percentage points in a year alone. Brokers continue to be well rated for their communication with clients 85% versus 69%, which was particularly important during peak COVID-19 outbreaks, but the lower levels of satisfaction correlated highly with frustrations around speed of approvals for loans via the broker channel. Indeed, while broker satisfaction with speed of approval was low across the board at 57% overall, those figures were better for proprietary channel at 61% compared to broker customers at 53%. This issue affects publicly acknowledged turnaround time disparities between the two channels. Speaking at a hearing of the Standing Committee on Economics during their ongoing review of the four major banks and other financial institutions in April, the chief executives of the four major banks all conceded that the time to yes for home loans was faster when customers went direct, which they attributed to a range of factors including technology, access to customer data and less complexity in borrower demographics. For example, CBA data shows that its median time for home loan approvals during the March quarter was 1.7 days direct, but 14.7 days via brokers, while NAB was at 3.8 days versus 8.3 days, and Westpac was 11 days versus a whopping 23 days. Indeed, the monthly broker pulse survey from Momentum Intelligence shows that across all lenders used by broker respondents, turnarounds had blown out to an average of more than 11 business days in early 2021. Moreover, the Australian Finance Group Index for April 2021 revealed that lender turnaround time surged to 27.1 days in the third quarter of 2021, compared with 25.2 days last quarter. Brokers continue to experience delays in turnarounds now. However, there are green shoots of improvements filtering through with the average time to initial credit decisions across all lenders down to an average of eight business days in July 21, its fastest time since the pandemic first hit in March 2020. But the damage appears to be done, with consumers less satisfied with their brokers because of it. Trust levels across both channels also fell in this report, with the broking channel dropping from 89% in 2020 to 83% in 2021, while for the proprietary channel, it's dropped at a faster rate from 67% in 2020 to 57% in 2021. 
Speaking of the issue of momentum intelligence head of strategy, Michael Johnson said that while turnarounds are generally outside of a broker's control, the way they communicate these delays to clients early and staying across how turnarounds are faring is key to mitigating later frustrations in the home loan process. He said, with the significant differences in turnaround times between lenders, it's critical that brokers go above and beyond to communicate status updates to their clients to maximise their satisfaction. This data shows clearly that clients who experienced much slower turnaround times were less satisfied with their broker. That's why brokers must take a proactive role in communicating application status updates. It has been a really challenging period for brokers and their clients, and our data shows that brokers that communicate better receive higher rates of satisfaction, even if the lender turnaround times are slightly longer. Now elsewhere, according to Domain, Australians have saved some $60 billion a year in cancelled overseas travel because of the pandemic, with part of that cash flowing into the property market. Buyers, lucky enough to keep their jobs, have been taking the opportunity to use their extra savings to get into the rising property market for the first time, move to a lifestyle destination, or even purchase a holiday home or investment property. In the year to June 2019, Australians 15 years and over spent $62.3 billion on international travel, or an average of $3,115 per person, finder analysis of tourism research Australia figures found. Separate figures from the Tourism and Transport Forum put the average outbound spend at $59.3 billion a year from 2016 to 2019. Although $3,115 travel budget may seem modest, when compared to property prices, the average figure masks larger international trips, as not everyone was holidaying overseas. The real difference is people who were planning a big $30,000 trip around Europe, and it's been off the table for a year now, or two years, find a home loan expert, Sarah Meganson said, every dollar we earn, we have to spend it in Australia. The agency general manager of Victoria, Peter Kokos, said lockdown first home buyers had saved money on holidays or other discretionary spending to put towards a deposit, while upgraders were also taking advantage of their savings. It's absolutely one of the big things that has fueled, particularly that first home buyer market, he said. But certainly in real estate, it's definitely prevalent right across the board. If people can't travel, they want to make sure they've got a better house or a bigger house. From a first home buyer view, there are the restaurants and the bars, which certainly have been quite limited, Kakos said, but travel was a more significant one because most people would put a big chunk of money towards it. It's been very much unsure as to when things will open up, he said. People aren't prepared to wait. They say, OK, the money's there, let's put it into property. LJ Hooker, Palm Beach, David Edwards, said some regular travels had been choosing to spend their holidays at home while it was safe to do so, and buying second residences. Domestic buyers who have often travelled overseas are reinvesting the discretionary money into particularly holiday properties, said the agent, who is based on Sydney's northern beaches. The Palm Beach and Well Beach market has seen a number of transactions over that period to domestic buyers that fit that category. Buyers were looking to get a return on the funds they were saving, Edwards said. If you look at the cash rate offered by banks, why would you put money in the bank, he asked. In the last couple of years, the upper northern beaches have appreciated anywhere between 20 and 40 percent, depending on one, the location, and two, what the property offered. Some savers were using the cash to buy investment properties, Rain and Horn Double Bays, Rick Sirigo said. They're saying, I'm getting 0.1 or 0.2 percent in the bank, at least with property, I've got a yield of 2 to 2.5 percent, and I'll continue to have some sort of capital growth, he said. Money is very, very cheap. Clients are getting a lot of equity as their properties go up, so they've got this paper equity to borrow from, and all of a sudden they've got this cash because they're not spending it on certain activities. Further north, Noosa has been drawing holiday makers who can't travel internationally and decide to purchase a home there. People who typically go to Europe every year for an extended period, or they holiday in Aspen, for example, some of those people I know have been spending longer in our area, said Tom Offerman of the eponymous real estate agency. 
he cited an example of a Victorian family staying at the local caravan park while their home state was in lockdown, who turned up at an auction and bought a property with hopes to move there permanently. It certainly is a substantial saving for a lot of people, he said, adding it was impossible to quantify how much of an effect it had on the market. Outside Melbourne, extended periods of remote working have prompted a sea change trend. Fletcher's Ballerine James Gladman said, people can afford to, they're not spending money on holidays and things, they're enjoying the lifestyle that the coastal areas provide, he said. It's almost like a permanent holiday. And many of Gladman's Melbourne buyers used to be holiday home buyers looking for smaller low maintenance homes, but he's seen a shift to permanent moves by purchasers wanting more space. Other grounded owners were spending their savings on making renovations, especially to improve their investment properties. Biggin and Scott Richmond, Andrew Crotty said, we're getting lots of calls about we're fixing up the kitchen in our rental property. What would it do? He said, how much would it affect the value? After the inner city rental market was affected by last year's lockdowns and rents fell, landlords have been making upgrades to secure tenants, he said. And finders Sarah Megason said savings could have an extra benefit to first home buyers by improving their serviceability when they apply for a home loan. Banks were scrutinising statements to make sure potential buyers weren't living beyond their means, she said. Instead of spending that money on travel or other consumer items, and you've been able to save that, it demonstrates to banks that you are a good prospect, she said. And finally, today National Australia Bank has announced that its Medfin finance team has signed a 10-year strategic partnership with medical indemnity insurance provider and Mutual Avant Mutual and its leading subsidiary Co Young Group. Medfin Finance provides financial solutions, loans and equipment finance for doctors, dentists and veterinarians and their practices. Under the partnership, Medfin's products will be white labelled and provided by Kuyong Group to Avant's 78,000 practitioner and medical student members. The partnership will provide customers with access to NAMA's business solutions through Kuyong's financial professionals, part of the Avant Group. NAB Group Executive for Business and Private Banking Andrew Irvin said that the partnership is part of a major bank strategy to continue to grow market share in specialised sectors like healthcare. Mr Irvin said, our business for specialised professional customers such as GPs and dentists has grown 7.5% over the last 12 months. This partnership with Avant will extend NAB's services even further by building on our expert knowledge in the sector and the network of more than 250 specialist health bankers. Avant Mutual Group Chief Executive and Managing Director Natasha Frenich commented that Avant had grown from its traditional base of medical indemnity insurance and has remained focused on finding ways to add value to our members' personal and professional lives. We're committed to supporting our members across their professional and personal lives with partnerships such as this, allowing them to access market-leading products from organisations who have a deep understanding of them and the medical environment, she said. NAB has been operating Medfin over the past 30 years, along with High Caps over the past 20 years, and NAB Health for more than 15 years. The mutual lending sector has been going through a period of consolidation amid rising cost pressures. In the past two months, two mergers have taken place in the sector between Newcastle Permanent and Greater Bank and Heritage Bank and People's Choice. Meanwhile, Teachers Mutual Bank and Pulse Credit Union also recently indicated they were inching closer to a merger after receiving approval from APRA. The Prudential Regulatory Authority warned last year that mutual banks may need to explore merger options if they face significant financial stress. According to Be Global, the rise in mutual mergers is a reflection of changing attitudes from management while margin headwinds could persist and rising costs for technology, maintenance and regulation hit home. So standing back, of course, you can see a lot more spruiking from the real estate sector and other hangers-on, but just reflect on the limited migration and limited population growth. Those mega trends, to my mind, are probably the most significant of all, because what it does mean is there, there are going to be less people demanding property ahead. And seeing as there are so many extra properties around already, more than 1.2 million spare properties on last count, 
it means that the supply-demand disequilibrium will continue. And of course, that means that demand for mortgages may become a little weaker than many expect. That, in turn, could flow to weaker house prices. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.